Good morning, everyone. My name is Dee Ryan, and on behalf of the team at Limerick Chamber, I'd like to warmly welcome you to this morning's seminar. Over the course of the past two weeks, the government has released a lot of detail for us on the reopening of business and society, and most recently, last Saturday, on the return to work safely protocol that is, is requiring businesses to comply with in order to be able to reopen their workplaces on a limited basis for employees. And so that really is uh, the subject of this morning's health and safety measures return to work webinar. And I'd like to thank Adrian Carmody for um, the work that he's put in. Um, Adrian is the MD of Optima Training Consultancy based in Castle Troy and they have huge experience in health and safety, quality and audit, uh, auditing training, as, as well as um, uh, a wealth of experience in working with various size of organizations to assist with um, training courses and in preparing, preparing people for the new COVID landscape. Um, Adrian is going to take us through in this session uh, and give us some guidance to how we should navigate this return to work process. But I would also urge you to please keep checking in on the COVID-19 support hub on our Limerick Chamber website for regular updates on what is um, a fast evolving situation. For those of you who've had a chance to review the, the Return to Work Safely protocol document, um, I, you no doubt have thoughts on how you're going to apply it yourselves in your workplace, but you'll have noticed that there's a lot of um, requirement for for training and for risk assessments. And I'd just like to advise you that on your behalf, we're working with Chambers Ireland to seek clarity from Minister Heather Humphreys on funding that may become available and lobby for funding to be made available specifically for organizations as they implement um, the changes, uh, both physical and behavioral um, training um, for, uh, for the return safely to their workplaces. Before I hand over to Adrian, I'd just like to wish the best of luck to our friends and colleagues in the construction sector, who, and for certain, um, certain people on this call who are in the retail sector, who are part of the phase one of the reopening of business, commencing next Monday, the 18th of May, um, where I'm, I'm <laughs> envious of you getting back in, and, uh, and best of luck with you all. Um, as you uh, adapt to our new uh, workplace environment. So once again, thank you for joining us this morning and I'll hand you over to Adrian. Thanks very much, uh, Dee and Quiva for uh, helping out on this and uh, obviously for Limerick Chamber for having Optima Training deliver. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was uh, no pressure. I was just told it was about 95 people from Quiva logged on. So uh, that's a great start to the morning. And I suppose we have a, quite a bit to cover in terms of preparing for the new uh, post-COVID landscape. So we'll be covering health and safety, but also a number of other items. So I'll just go through some material with you in terms of health and safety, HR, GDPR, all the various considerations really that we need to look at in, term, in terms of how we prepare for, co for the new COVID landscape and whether we're returning to work or whether we're actually open already and just get, getting our, our, ourselves organized for the new return to work protocols that have been released, as Dee said. So the first one, uh, just in terms of moving along, I suppose there's a lot of slides. This is kind of a sign of the times. Uh, one of my colleagues in one of the business groups sent me on this lately, but uh, this is kind of sign of the times at the moment that we have. Um, so just a little bit about ourselves. So Optima Training do a lot of different types of training courses. D said, I won't dwell on this too long because it is only a 45 minute session. So instructor led live webinars and e-learning courses. So there'll be quite a lot of content in this slide and there's some of the training courses that we do. There will be quite a lot, as I said, of material here on the presentation. So it'll be kind of quite content heavy, but the main thing is that it's available for you afterwards. So we'll send you on the presentation as well. So if you feel there's quite a lot going on, it's just more really for reference afterwards. So there's a chat feature there as well. Uh, so if anybody has any questions, uh, they can pop them into the chat feature and we'll try to really get to those at the end or the Q and A feature as well. We also have our handouts, uh, which will be are, are attached to the uh, webinar, and we have polls as well, which will be launched throughout the, ses the, the session. Just my own contact details there, if anyone needs anything, if anyone wants to contact us about anything afterwards in terms of return to work protocols or return to work consultancy or services. 
Okay, just our own experience, why we're delivering this, I suppose we are working on the ground with businesses at the moment. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking to people, we're doing audits, risk assessments, we've been uh, calling to a huge number of companies and working with them in terms of their action plans and their response plans to get back to work and for companies who are already back to work. So we have that practical experience of, of working with them and seeing what other companies are putting together in terms of their responses as well, which is very important. Things that we found, I suppose, is confusion over it. A huge amount of data is coming out, but it can be quite hard to decipher exactly what's going to be required for yourself, how to implement it into your own business. A bit of sometimes, a bit of lack of appreciation for the full extent of what's involved. Often we hear people saying, okay, yeah, I have to get my safety statement done. I have to get my risk assessment done. But if you've gone through the return to work protocol, you will be well aware that there's so much more involved in terms of business continuity, in terms of HR, communication, huge amount of other uh, tasks that we have to do. And then just a quick word on a couple of the issues that we're finding from a practical point of view that companies have. For example, is a very good company up in uh, North Tipperary uh, during the week and their biggest challenge was actually getting staff back to work. So they had their customers, their customers wanted their services, but the unfortunate thing was, although they are considered an essential business, they were finding a real challenge in terms of getting their staff back to work. Um, you know, anecdotally, they were talking about the layoff scheme, you know, the 350 euro payments, all of that type of thing, which was really, there's a lot of legitimate reasons out there, obviously, why staff can't get back to work. For example, if creches aren't back open, it's, it can be very hard in terms of childcare. But for, uh, there, there's others then, I suppose, that anecdotally, there is that issue where, um, you know, unless that begins to change, people are going to struggle. And then how they deal with that, you know, it can be dealt with by carrot or by stick, I suppose. So there's a way of dealing with it in terms of employment, you know, disciplinary and grievance and all that. But will that really be productive in the long run in dealing with your staff like that? So it really is engaging with your staff and, and getting them back and giving them the clarity and security that they're going to be safe when they do return. That's probably the most important thing. Okay, so just move along on the session. Just a very quick recap. This is items that people will already know, but just bringing it together. So obviously the, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19 has been upgraded to pandemic symptoms of coughing, breathing, and temperature. Now, the temperature tends to be, from a work point of view, seems to have been set at 38.0 degrees, and we talk about that in a few moments when we talk about temperature scanning. Uh, in terms of the spread, it can be done directly within two meter uh, distance, or it can be done if basically someone touches a surface which has been contaminated already and then touches their eyes, nose, or mouth. So there are the different ways it tends to be spread. And that's why the physical distancing is so important in terms of getting people to the two meter away or putting up barrier screens and all the other kind of tactics that people are using in terms of trying to get that distancing at work. Uh, just brief numbers now, this is uh, as of yesterday, uh, 23,000 uh, cases, just about 1,500 deaths, isolation and mental health difficulties that are, have arisen from COVID-19. And then the economic possible burns of about 30 billion this year. We have 53,000 uh, employers now availing of the work subsidy scheme, 460,000 people approximately. And the employment figures going from approximately 4.8%, which was almost pretty much full employment when we were back in February, to right now at just under the 30% mark. Now, obviously, we're really hoping that that will, slide, will go back down over the next couple of weeks as employers and construction and everybody else goes back to work over the, over the different phases that we have. So a huge effect economically and to, to a human degree. Just a quick question for you all. If you pop, your de pop the details of this back on the poll that's just about to go onto your screen. So which of these do you rate as a key factor in preparing your business for COVID? So which of these would be the most important factor for you, do you think? If you just click on one of the answers there, and I'll give you the kind of overall uh, guideline as to what people are thinking. So if you wouldn't mind popping on one of those answers, that'd be great. We're going to see who's listening now. Okay, I'll just give it another couple of seconds because the figures are changing rapidly. Um, so, okay, so we're getting reasonably consistent now in terms of the numbers. So we have approximately 50% of people who have responded who have said health and safety is the most important. About 3% for HR or GDPR. Obviously, they're probably all the HR managers that are on the group. We have infection control for about 40% communications for about 12% and business continuity for about 13%. So there's a wide variety. Obviously, health and safety and infection control are the critical issues for people. So, uh, and, and that's as you would probably expect, but it's good to see that other people are, are factoring in the other conditions that are there as well. So that's important. So I'm just gonna pop out of that. 
and uh, go on to the next slide, which is basically, this was something I put up on LinkedIn myself and my own LinkedIn page uh, just during the week because a lot of people were contacting us saying, okay, there's just volumes and volumes of information. And if anybody who's probably has, has, has done some research, you see this document there, which is the COVID return to work document. And I have some links on the slide. And we also had the NSAI document as well. Two significant documents, I suppose, with a lot of content and a lot of information in there. But more importantly, how do we summarize it? How do we bring that together? So I've tried to do in a very basic way, I suppose, over one document is just to bring something like that together. Uh, so general health and safety uh, concerns. So then we have HR, GDPR, and everything else then as well. So HR, GDPR, data protection, infection prevention, control, communications, business continuity. So they're all the different things just to give people a little guideline as, as to what maybe they should be looking at and what are the key questions they need to address. So I have that also actually as a handout for you. So I think that's gone on to your handout system. The next thing we'll look at is the phases of, of reopening. So this is basically the response um, that we're looking at. So we have the phases and dates for return to work. We have the return to work protocol. We have the financial supports and we have the reviewing of business models, which is really all around business continuity. And I've just included there the link to that document there as well that you might have seen. So another poll for you there. Is your business currently open? You might, could, I, could I just get a handle on how many are open and how many are yet to open? Okay, so the numbers are coming in roughly at 60, 40, as far as I can see there, thereabouts. So about 60% of businesses from the full group that we have this morning are actually opened already with 39, 40% uh, due to open. That's interesting because, you know, we assume that so many of businesses are actually closed, but the reality is there's a lot more businesses open than sometimes what we think because of technology, because of remote working. And that then brings its own challenges. And then we have the other 40% who are still to reopen. And even the people who have opened already still have to be very much aware of the return to work protocol. I've heard someone saying, but we're open already, so this doesn't really apply to us. You know, of course it applies. It means you'd have to go back and make sure that all the protections are in place for your staff, for your clients. And I think businesses will bear the brunt of not having prepared properly for this in terms of the clients that will come into their premises. You know, we've been told so many times that, you know, it's, it's people now see all the signage, the floor markings and all the other queue management systems. They're the places that people want to go into because they have the confidence to go into that premises because they know they're taking COVID seriously and the virus spread seriously. And that's going to be important as well. So the first one is a phase return to business. I'm going to breeze through this. Again, most of these slides are just for your own reference. Monday the 18th, obviously, is just this Monday and landscapers construction hardware are going to reopen, but there's a continuation of ret a return to work uh, for, a wage for the wage subsidy scheme and also the COVID layoff scheme still continues. So then the Monday the 8th of June, smaller retailers are open up and people who can do some amount of physical distancing. Okay. Then we're on to the 29th of June for creches and preschools. Actually, just a word on the uh, creches and preschools. It was due to open up for the, um, for the children of childcare workers already, but you might have seen in the news in the last couple of days that basically there was not only nine applications countrywide for that scheme. So they've actually cancelled that completely. So the date we're actually looking at is the 29th of June. And the reason that I'm spending a moment on that is because that is a real key difficulty that people have of bringing their staff to work, even if they're back to work legitimately themselves. If you have kids at home and you've nobody, nobody to mind them and there's no procedures in place for that, it is a legitimate reason why people might not be able to return. And then we have to decide how we're going to deal with that because a lot of us need our staff back if we're going to be able to do that. Now, thankfully, so many of us are working remotely at the moment and that can be working quite well, but there are significant challenges around that. If you're going to have people work remotely in the long run, I mean, we have to factor in what are the conditions. So we, the, people have the exact same protections at home as they do if they were in the office. So the law extends to their home in terms of provisions of DSE, displaced screen equipment, all the different things they might need, what chairs are sitting on, what monitors are looking at. So the same conditions from an ergonomic point of view apply from the business right through to the home. So that's a challenge for people. And really, because it's been a short term thing, people haven't worried about it too much so far. But I think if it's going to continue, then that's something that people will be really be under pressure to, uh, to step up to. So then we have Monday the 20th of July, the, the uh, children of all the children of the crashes and basically everybody else, including the hairdressers. So, so, so many people are going to be happy about that. And then galleries, places of work. So by Monday 20th, the 20th of July and then Monday 10th of August is pretty much the last stage. So anyone who can work 
should be back to work as long as they can physical distance, staggering hours, and doing all the other tactics that people can do to get back to work at that point. Okay, the next section we're going to talk about is the return to work protocol. Uh, now, just to have mentioned a quote at the bottom of that from the Irish Congress of Trade Unions, basically saying it was the most important document that has ever been produced for the workplace. Okay, that's a fairly significant statement, and it shows how seriously they're taken that. And you can see on the slide there that I've included a link to that also as well. So when you get uh, the soft copy of the presentation later on, you'll be able to just click on those links and go on there. Um, I suppose they have compliance measures in place that they can actually close business who don't comply to this. So all of this matter should not be taken lightly by any business. Okay, what, are the, what is the return to work protocol? Very, very simply, it's to make sure that when we return to work, there won't be a continuation of the spread of the virus. They're all talking about the reproduction rate of the virus. So the reproduction rate, what we're trying to do is keep it below one. In Germany, since reopening, uh, it's, it's gone beyond one. And they're now looking at potentially drawing back some of the facilities that have been made available. Um, anecdotally, a lot of people would have heard recently about South Korea and uh, nightclubs and all the rest of that, which opened up as well. And a lot of that had been pulled back as well. So it's very important that when places open up, they put all their measures in place to make sure they're protected. It's about shared responsibility between the employer and the employee. So it's not just about the employer having to do everything. It's also about the employee having a duty of care and an onus to contact the company whether they're not feeling well, if they feel they need to isolate, if they feel there's any reason, or other people aren't complying with the business. So at a session yesterday, and it was very interesting that one of the one of the people on the group had mentioned that one of the staff members had come to them and they had a they had a tactic whereby there would be only three people in their canteen. So there was five or six people in there together, but it was one of the other staff members that came back to the compliance officer and basically said that that was happening. And that is the culture that you need in terms of staff taking on responsibility and accountability as well as management to make sure COVID is, is managed properly. Uh, so then the management team, we have a continuity manager, worker representatives, they're there to ensure compliance. And if you go through all the documents, you'll see there's, it seems to be a lot of people that are actually required for this, but some of those roles might be taken by the same person. For example, who's going to be the com communications officer? That might be the same person who's the continuity manager, for example, but we'll talk about that in a moment. So it's all about return and risk and how we manage that risk. So what do we need? The key aspects is risk assessments, safety statements, questionnaires and reinduction. The CIF actually and construction are back on Monday, but the CIF have a fantastic facility on their website in terms of questionnaires and reinduction. So the questionnaires should be sent out to people uh, no, no less than three days from when they actually return to work. So if people are back at work already, so be it. They get the questionnaires now that they're already working back there. But if they haven't come back to work, they actually need to receive those three days from when they come back. Then we also have our reinduction. What's that? It's basically your normal HR induction, but this is a reinduction for policies and procedures that have changed, uh, health and safety that has changed, infection prevention and control that has changed around COVID. So that must be done as well. How do we respond to suspected cases? What's our policy changes? And then how do we manage the risk of exposure? So if they're the kind of key questions we're going to ask just over the next number of minutes. Okay, one more poll. Does your business have staff working remotely? So if you could click on one of those answers there. Okay, so we have approximately 90% even, even, even at, a, at, at the start of this who have staff working remotely. And again, important factors to consider when you have staff working remotely is, first of all, how you manage them, how you manage their performance. That's, that's one part of it. But also then, as I said, the DSE requirements that you might have there as well. So what do you need to provide your staff? How do you need to communicate out to your staff to make sure that their health and safety is looked after as well? How about from a GDPR HR point of view? So from GDPR, how secure is their network? Where are they sharing their files? What kind of uh, Wi-Fi do they have? All of these different things could come under an ICT policy, which is a, requ a requirement, and also a working from home policy should be prepared for staff who are working from home. Okay. So general questions um, are things I suppose we talked about already. Homework and required, phase reintroduction. We're going to talk about all of those bits and pieces. First of all, communications. Who does it and what do we communicate out to staff? So what measures and what medium? So basically, what things do we say and over what do we say it? Are we to send in, Are we having Zoom meetings with them or uh, other type of meetings with them? Are we touching base with our staff? How are we managing their, their efficiency? And then are we sending them out the things we need to send them out, like the return to work questionnaires? Um, are we giving them signage? 
So uh, communications to contractors, clients, suppliers, all different things. So for example, if we have deliveries coming in, have we any process in place to manage deliveries so that deliveries aren't coming through a main reception area if they don't need to? So we're seeing companies put in policies in place where you know, deliveries are waiting outside and somebody goes out to them. So to just ensure physical distance and making sure that uh, not a lot of people come into contact with that person. Health and safety, uh, 50, more than 50% of you mentioned health and safety as a key concern. Um, so what do we need for health and safety? So safety statements, risk assessments, SOPs, so standard operating procedures. We need internal audits. Uh, we need training for staff. We need ergonomics for remote working or DSE awareness. And we need uh, response measures. So just a couple of key ones on those. Safety statement is a legally required document. Document We must all have that. We should have it in every walk of life in, for all businesses, in any case before COVID, but now especially it's needed to update COVID-19. Parts of a, a safety statement, I'll leave that, that's just for your own reference afterwards in terms of maybe how you structure your safety statement if you don't already have one. Um, but it must be, it must contain then the risk assessment. Okay, the risk assessment is an integral part of your safety statement. And the risk assessment in this case, we normally have a risk assessment for machines and for all other health and safety, but now you have a risk assessment specifically in relation to COVID. And basically you're taking responsibility to make sure that that's all documented as well. That will go on to the safety statement. What is a risk assessment in general? I suppose it's very clearly the likelihood of something happening versus multiplied by the severity of the impact of it. So for example, looking at your hazards, for the, the, the virus in this case is the hazard, identifying the risk, who might be harmed, assessing the risk, the risk obviously would be contracting the virus, uh, reviewing your current controls, so what have you already put in place, and then looking at what steps you need to take, so looking at the gap between what you have done and what you need to do, and then organizing to implement and action those items. And the last part of the risk assessment then would be ongoing monitoring and make sure it's actually effective. And that's part of the return to work protocols as well. So your risk assessment must be there with your safety statement and you must make sure that you can monitor to see how effective it is. There's no point in having a risk assessment if it's not impacting. If you're still, if there's a spread of virus, then the risk assessment may not be fully taken into account what is going on. And when we're dealing with places like nursing homes and care centers, that's a very important part that they have. So they can have a risk assessment but obviously they're continuously monitoring that to make sure it's actually working. And you know they have metrics in place for that. This is a, an SOP standard operating procedure that we had done recently for a construction company. And again, we have templates of those that anybody wants them, they can just contact us and we can share some information with them. Um, question for you, does the employer reserve the right to monitor temperature of employees? So if you could vote on that one for me, please. Okay, this is a little bit more even. So currently we have around 40% saying they do, about 11% saying that they don't. And interestingly, 50% or 50 odd percent of people saying they're not sure. Okay, and that's, it's kind of quite a controversial topic actually, temperature uh, scanning. The answer to the question is first of all, yes, they do. The employer does reserve the right within the return to work protocol and within the uh, protection and improvement guide from the NSAI to actually monitor temperatures. How it does that now is a different matter and, and basically how you deal with people who don't want to engage with it is a different challenge. So it does reserve the right, but what technology it uses. So for example, on the, on the screen there, you might be able to see thermometer basically, which is, needs to be reasonably close to the person. I suppose that's the difficulty there. So you're talking about difficulties with PPE, with physical distancing in terms of taking the temperature. What is the temperature? Roughly about 38 degrees. That's what people are using. But we kind of suggest to people, if you're going with that, that you do have the option to retest after a number of minutes in case there's a false positive, in case there's a false reading, and maybe having a second thermometer even, because if there's a fault, if there's a fault with one, then you have to retest with another. What are other people doing? So a lot of people are going with smaller businesses are going with the likes of the handheld thermometer. It's infrared, so it's non-touch. Um, other people, obviously, larger companies with larger budgets are going for different facilities, such like the one you have down on the bottom of the screen. So you walk through your temperature scanners or you walk past the temperature uh, recorder. Now, the issue with that is, is quite costly. So it can be anywhere from three to 15,000 euro, whereas your thermometer up the top there is you know, roughly 60 euro plus that. Um, and people can let me know if they need any of those. We have people who can provide them uh, through our services. Um, so it's important. 
how do we manage it as well? So we've talked to people who, are, who have the more expensive option and but queue management is a big factor for them then. You can't still have everybody, like even in the picture on the screen, it's a difficult process. You have everybody lined up one after the other. So we really need to kind of stagger things like work times to make sure people aren't coming in right on top of each other and they're physically distancing. So we have queue management, we have floor markings, we have all of these things like you have in your local supermarket probably to keep people back from each other. And then we obviously have to talk about more about temperature scanning. What if they refuse? If they refuse, what can we do? Basically, we can put in disciplinary and control measures as long as we update our employment handbook to reflect that. So that's another concern. And then could we have GDPR or HR issues? GDPR issues, we're now monitoring temperature for the first time that sensitive medical data of people. What are we doing with it? How long are we storing it? Who has access to it? So that's the GDPR concern out of temperature scanning. Then we have the COVID response. What happens if we do get somebody with a high temperature and we do suspect that they may have COVID? What, so we have a COVID-19 manager, they set the process. And then the employee has a duty to inform management or else management obviously can temperature uh, check. From speaking with a lot of companies, there, there's, a there's a variance between some people are taking the temperature themselves, so they're appointing somebody or people to take the temperature. And then we have a secondary option where people are actually taking the temperature themselves and logging it. So there's a huge amount of trust in plan B there. And we still have to have a chain of action that follows from if somebody has that high temperature, what is it? So the first part of the return to work protocol is it says we have to find an isolated area. So isolated to a, a confidential area somewhere with a closed door, somewhere with all the, the uh, hygiene and infection control, somewhere with PPE, and somewhere that's private so p other people won't know that that person is actually there. Then we have to send them back to their medical professional or we have to arrange transport, and that's a challenge in itself. They go to their medical professional and then they, are to, they have a duty and an onus to present for test if, if they're called for a test or if the, there is access to a test. Isolate for 14 days if they have a positive test or otherwise, and then you know, the employer can look for a return to work certificate that's advised after a minimum of 14 days. One of the biggest changes on COVID and the return to work pro protocol is around the contact tracing log. So what is that? That means basically that all our employees have to keep a record of who they have come into close contact with uh, each day. And then if there's a positive case, they will look back on the previous 48 hours before the symptoms began, and they will check each person's contact log, and they will decide then on that basis uh, what procedures need to be put in place via risk, a risk assessment to see whether those other people need to self-isolate also. That's quite a challenge for a lot of companies and something that people wouldn't have been doing before and now will be a requirement for them. So it's actually an, you know, a clear requirement to the system that we all need to start doing as soon as our employees are back at work. The isolation area, I'm not going to talk about that too much. It just has to be a closable door. Uh, tissues, hand sanitizer, PPE, and clinical waste bags. So uh, that's what needs to be in the room. And then it has to be professionally cleaned if somebody else has access to it or has used it because there was uh, you know, a suggestion that they might have had COVID or high temperature even. For infection prevention and control, different things we might want to talk about. So deep cleaning, that's consideration from us. Uh, sodium hydrochloride and fogging, we have that as well. So we have uh, cleaners, professional cleaners who would generally go in and do that. And we kind of suggest that even in our own business, what we will do is people come back, we will do that, get them to reorganize the office and then do a full clean with an empty office. And then we will work back from there. Uh, sanitizing stations are common touch points. So for example, some of this kind of is a conflict with normal health and safety. We say we want people to hold the handrails, but now when they hold the handrails, there's a, you know, that's a common touch point. How clean are they? We want to make sure that we have sanitizing stations at all those common touch points. Places like printers, anywhere where a lot of staff are likely to go, that's where the location of those hand sanitizers should be. I mentioned clock-in systems there, but you know, uh, they have recommended that we disable any clock-in systems which require fingerprints. Okay, because of the risk of the spread of the virus. So what, we've, what we're hoping people would use is QR scanners. They use um, card scanners in terms of the clock-in systems. And there's a lot of apps from places coming out and we have, we have some of those on our systems as well in terms of you know, software apps that can record that instead rather than having somebody physically touch a unit. What's our PPE policy? So our protective equipment. So gloves, masks, visors. Right at this moment in time, unless there's been a direction from the government this morning, which there's, there, there could well be, uh, masks are not mandatory so far, but companies can make them mandatory for themselves. And I've been in a number of companies and the first thing I've been handed when I get there is a mask or a visor or gloves. So they determine their own policy. 
you have to have an etiquette in coughing and sneezing and signage for that, physical contact and distancing. Limitation of numbers in areas. So for example, canteen, let's go back to the canteen. How many people can go in there at one time? How many people can be in a meeting at one time? So instead of now of having a big board meeting with 10 people in it, we can do internal or remote uh, meetings on Zoom or Skype or from Teams or whatever the case may be. So we're, we're doing it all times, trying to limit the amount of people in any given area. And then your waste disposal plans are going to be important as well. Okay. So just a question. Just could you list one tactic that you think might be useful? Uh, and you pop this into the uh, chat, if you don't mind, just so it's going to see a couple of them coming in. One tactic or technique you think would be useful for physical distancing. So if you use that. Okay. So if anyone pops that onto the uh, chat function, just going to see a couple of them coming in and seeing what ideas people have. What would, yeah, so let me share, work in, so there's loads of them coming in now. Floor stickers, very good. Markings in common areas. Okay. Perspex, so physical barriers. Workstation screens. So yeah, absolutely screens, what they call spit guards or screens. Uh, once, you, okay, so the canteen, limiting the amount of people in the canteen. So all the different things, you probably see those, those coming in the chat there as well. So one way floor systems, absolutely excellent. So traffic light systems on the floor to stop people from crossing each other. Uh, one way systems, floor systems, markings, limit people in the canteen, Michelle, yeah, absolutely. We have a reversal sign for the canteen so they know the capacity. Okay, so full or not full, basically, very good. Yep, perfect, William. Okay, audio announcement, physical distancing measures. So that would work for retail, for shops, for uh, for other sections. Uh, bathroom flows, and again, so I'm gonna have a look at the, what, the things that I'm suggesting for that as well. So there's a huge amount of things that we can think about and a lot of things that people are doing. So first of all, we have our facility requirements. What do we actually want to achieve on there? And the facility requirements that we're gonna look at, just keeping an eye on the time to make sure I'm not going too far over for you. Physical distancing of two meters or more, with hygiene stations with, uh, with sanitizers. We want uh, signage and floor markings. We want traffic light, one-way systems, all the different things you're talking about there. Door management, security and access. So can somebody just walk in? I mean, what do people think now of a visitor walking in with a brochure into your reception and, and, and looking to talk to somebody or hand over that brochure? That art of selling is probably pretty much dead in the water over the next period of time, isn't it? Because nobody wants to see anybody coming in that's not invited or that hasn't had a risk assessment or that hasn't completed a questionnaire, a self-declaration to say that they're feeling okay. Uh, so other things, so the hatches are the physical barriers. And I know the company I've seen in the news are Shade Tech, you know, very innovative. They were wor working on screens, you know, and, uh, and blinds, and they've innovated to look after this market now. So it's great to see people like that adapting and being flexible and being able to supply the market. Uh, another company I know in plastics in, in, in Anacotti here in Limerick, uh, very innovative again, and have gone on now and are working with the HSE in terms of aprons. And that's fantastic to see again. And it's great to see those businesses doing well. Uh, it's a crisis for a lot of people, but there are people who are able to look around and I suppose adapt as quickly as they possibly can to save their business and to actually expand and grow their business at a time like this as well. We have catering, canteen and washrooms, temperature stations and isolation rooms. There are other factors we have to look at for our facilities. Technology and remote working, do we have all the facilities we need for that? Ventilation and air quality, such as filtration. So I was talking to a person I know, Dave from uh, Breeze Air, and you know, people like that have all those systems in place to, to ensure the air quality is sufficient and to allow for air change as well. And that's part of the process too. We have waste management. So who's gonna take in away the waste? It, the guideline is that it, the waste should be there for 72 hours before it's removed, but it also should be tied. And then we also have a factor of clinical waste. How is that managed? That would be normally managed very much separately to your normal waste bags, okay? And then we have our physical distance and suggestions. What things can we do? So from a practical point of view, what things can we implement into our business to make sure that people are further away or protected? So first of all, staggered reopening of the business. That would mean bringing some staff back, first of all, and then bringing more staff back afterwards. How about things like uh, staggered work times? So instead of having everybody work at 9 a.m., you have people work from 7.30, 8, all the way through, and they have you know, five-minute intervals of actually groups of people starting. Mix of remote and office space. That's a lot of what we are doing already. Shift patterns and staggered times, limit numbers in the canteen, all different things that you suggested in your tactics there. Work specialization. What basically does that mean? So work specialization means that instead of having a lot of people do a lot of tasks, you now try and make sure that you have less people doing each task. So they're not rotating. They're not using huge amounts of different pieces of equipment. Work and break in teams. So where teams work together, can they break together? So can they where they are you know, in, in some kind of close contact, we keep that team together instead of mixing them with other teams. 
one thing you might see when you go into places now where you know somebody and you're about to handshake, you know, that doesn't happen. So no, no physical contact. Limit carpooling. Up at a company last Friday and one of their big things was they've stopped carpooling because that was something they were actively encouraging. Now they can't have four people jump into the car at the same time and come to work. Flights, public transport, so limitations of all of those which are putting people in jeopardy in close contact. On-site contractors, on-site visitors. How many of them do we need? Can we do these meetings remotely? Do we have to have them on site where there's an added risk? Queue management, you'll see that in your local supermarket. Okay, they're highly effective at that because they've been doing it from the start. Uh, electronic payments, okay, how do we manage that so we're not taking cash? Set times for deliveries and collections. So if say, someone is collecting something from your work, whether it's your career or whatever else, just managing to make sure there's not multiple pe people coming to your business or your company at the same time. Isolate individual buildings. So we have large multinationals which have multiple business buildings and what they're doing is basically not interacting with each other uh, from a physical point of view. So they're not going from building to building. Set staff on the same equipment, on the same tools, on the same machinery. So we had a company there with forklifts and they're trying to make sure the same person or same couple of individuals use that same machine. So there's not a huge amount of people using it. And again, that decreases the risk of the virus transfer. Stopping of hot desking. So you might have a facility where somebody uses the, the desk and then somebody else uses it and all the rest of it. We're trying to stop a little at that as much as is practicable because that has a risk of the virus as well without significant cleaning going on. And uh, the movement of items such as printers. So that was something that came up yesterday for a company. You know, the location of their printer put themselves in right in the middle of a staffing area, which meant that a huge amount of staff were going over to that printer. So we might have to adjust our facility in that way and physical distance from there. Moving on a little bit into HR, the whole HR area. So we need a crisis manager uh, and, and a deputy in terms of the, uh, the response criteria. We also need to adjust our handbook and policies and procedures because now, as I said already, we're doing temperature scanning. We might have to put in disciplinary and sanctions measures, short-term working hours. All of these different things might be things that we hadn't already considered within our employment uh, strategy. Back to work questionnaires with our three-day notice. I mentioned that, our reinduction. We might have a role in HR in contact tracing or in contact logs. Uh, what if we want to change the shift times or the work patterns of employees? We'll need to engage with them. We've been told in the, in the, in the procedures not to unilaterally do that, but obviously to engage with our staff and unions would have an, an issue in that as well. Then we have supports for staff like employee engagement programs. Um, so assistance programs. So to help staff who might, I suppose, have difficulties in this time. And I suppose we've all been maybe made aware of different people who have different issues going on and how they need to be supported. So the assistance programs will be beneficial there. Um, and then what do we need to communicate out to them? The illness, the social welfare procedures, sick pay. What if you, sell, what if you ask somebody to self-isolate? Are you paying them? Are you not? You need to document your procedures around that. And then one thing that came up for a number of people over recent sessions has been you know, the tax liability that comes from the wage subsidy scheme. So for example, that payment you know, can, can cover, cover, carry excuse me, a tax liability going forward. So maybe into next year, your tax credits might be amended because you may have been overpaid via the wage subsidy scheme because it's not taxed at source. But that's something for your accountant and your payroll administrator to maybe talk to that about. But if it's a matter that there may be a tax liability into the future, it's certainly something that should be um, encouraged now to communicate out to staff. Just, this is for your own reference, just a pre return to work questionnaire, some questions that can be put on that. And it can also cover a self-declaration. So people at the end have to self-declare and sign off to say, yes, they haven't been in close contact, they haven't had the virus, they don't have any symptoms, they haven't traveled, et cetera. And again, the CIF have good facilities there and there's, uh, we can prepare documentation for people also. Just some training on PPE, cleaning, hygiene, uh, hygiene waste disposal, uh, restrictive movements, and the normal training like manual handling, fire, DSE awareness. They're all things that HR might have to be involved in, in terms of the provision of training also. Some of the things that we're finding coming back from HR in terms of challenges that they're facing, first of all, man, just the management of remote workers in the first place is a significant challenge. Uh, you know, compliance with SOPs. So if you come up to your operating procedures, what happens if somebody doesn't adhere to those? Are there sanctions in place? Are there warning systems in place? You know, are we having a traffic light system? Well, so we might have a, a level one warning, level two warning, level three warning. You know, certain people will take a little bit of getting used to this as well and can do things accidentally, but it, there may be sanctions that we have to put in place if that continues. How do we manage absenteeism, uh, refusal to work? As I said at the start, a very, very real concern. Half of the business that we've talked to in a previous session had mentioned it was their key concern, in fact. 
not their ability to reopen, not their ability to be able to put the measures in place to address the concerns, but actually to bring their staff back when they need them. Yep, could it constitute unauthorized absence? Absolutely, it could. You have a contract of employment there, but I suppose you have to take into account each person's uh, significant difficulties. What if somebody has underlying health conditions? You know, how are they going to be protected? Have you a risk, risk assessment in place for pregnant employees, for example? All of those need to be factored in as to how you deal with your employees on a return to work basis. So basically you mentioned if the temperature is high and then you have your own DSE responsibilities. Very briefly on GDPR and data protection. I kind of mentioned this at the start, but you're now retaining medical data. So if somebody's temperature is over 38 degrees, you're documenting it, what are you doing with the information? It's sensitive medical data, are we storing it? How safely has it been stored? Who has access to it? How long are we retaining it for? All of that has to be factored in, as well as the data security and communications around ICT. So there are factors to be involved in your GDPR or your data protection policy that you might have to engage with also. And some people kind of forget some of these side issues. They might be considered side issues because they're not health and safety, they're not infection prevention and control, but they are still critical measures that people need to consider. Then the management of contractors. So does your contractor have to be on site? Have you got questionnaires for our contractors or our visitors? So we can send out that out to our contractors now, you know, our approved vendors list to make sure that if they're going to come on site, they have all that documentation already prepared for us and how we're going to manage deliveries and shipping, for example. Okay, the last one of these for the morning. Uh, so which, let's talk about business continuity. Which of these do you think is the most important area to regard for business continuity? to make sure your business is going to be sustained and continue into the long run. Which of these is the most critical factor of those below? Okay, so we're people, we have people voting now. So if we could just, yeah, keep going there. We have, okay, there's a, there's a good split actually on this one. So I'll give another couple of seconds and I'll just let you know what, I'm, what, what, what we're seeing here. Okay, so interestingly enough, about 30% of people are looking at keep uh, management personnel as being their critical factor about 35 for general staffing. So general staffing has won it actually on 34%. Uh, facilities in IT on about 16%. Supplier management, interestingly enough, is only 4%. And yet when I had a session yesterday with, uh, with a, a group of people from a particular industry, they said supplier management was their most important factor. And then you have customer management, which is 30%. So making sure that you have your customers. And I'll talk about those uh, just for a moment. But that's just some interesting results there on that that would be slightly different from maybe uh, some other areas. So just bear with me one second now. Uh, our mouse went missing. Okay, so just looking at business continuity. These are the areas that we're looking at. Key management. If something happens to key management when your company, can you continue? Or have you contingencies or a plan B in place? Who's going to deputize? Who's going to step up? You know, if a number of the key management uh, team were to be struck down with COVID, for example, how are you going to continue? General staffing then, have you, uh, you know, a policy in place for how you're going to manage if a number of your staff become ill, have to self-isolate or don't return to work? What is the level at which you can still do business? Some people can still do a certain amount of business with very few staff and other people need absolutely everybody in a manufacturing environment. Sometimes there's a required number you have to have to run machines safely, et cetera. So have you another plan B or contingency in place in terms of you know, temporary recruitment, for example, reach out to your local recruitment company and say to them, how, you know, where, how are you fixed for general staffing? Uh, facilities, what do we need to put in place? So for example, where you know, some call centers have the flexibility to be able to move their facility or a part of their facility from one area to another. Uh, I know that, you know, for example, three moving, you know, have the ability to move some hundred or so people to Ennis should they need to, you know, if that facility was to have to close again due to COVID, for example, if there was an outbreak there. Your IT, we're all using IT, we're all on broadband, we're all working from home. You know, what happens if your IT falls over? Do you have, a, you know, a contingency in place? Do you have a contract or do you have an IT provider in place to either have a second broadband point uh, at service or something else that would allow you to continue. Suppliers, okay, on the suppliers end, it's very important for some people. And they've seen that over recent weeks, where the supplier, maybe in China or wherever else they've been dealing with, 
have you know no longer in operation then we haven't been able to get our raw material and we haven't been able to do business so i'm aware of so many essential businesses who still had to close despite being essential businesses because they couldn't get the raw material i think there's going to be a sea change about our supplier management going forward and we're seeing that from the irish companies now that are adapting and being flexible and being able to provide the hse and others with medical things like masks um, you know, plastics, aprons, all the different things that they need. And that's great to see. And it probably means that we need to relook at that and not have all our eggs in one supplier basket, as it were, and make sure we have that flexibility and some local providers as well that can help us out and keep that business local. Um, because, you know, if flights go, if shipping goes, at least within our own country, I suppose we can, we can give that business and we can get our supplies. Customers are the other one. Certain people have spoken to me about their, their previous over-reliance on customers. So, you know, they might be reliant on a couple of customers for all of their business. And, you know, if that customer can't, can't do business or has to close, then it has a huge knock-on effect on everybody else. And just finally, just on the back to work and the supports then as well. So just when people do come back, I think it's very, very important that people engage with staff and are optimistic with them and let them know how they're going to do, you know, that they're, 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 telling, they're removing the uncertainty for them. And they're giving them the security to say, look, we're open and we're back in business and we're here for the long run. So the people aren't worried about their jobs and their positions. Then when you do come back, things like the supports that are available, make use of them. You know, if you need to make use of them, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with taking the supports that are available, whether it's through Leo or whether the enterprise board or, or, or whatever else. You know, take the payment breaks, reduce the cost. So things like, for example, just the financial supports that are there, the wage subsidy scheme, a lot of companies are, are working off that at the moment. So whether that's 70 up to 85% even of lower paid workers rebated by the government on a weekly basis. And a huge amount of people are availing of that. The COVID layoff scheme of the 350 euro, which people are availing of, that is set to reduce somewhat over the next number of weeks, I'm told, as people come back to work. Now, hopefully the wage subsidy scheme, and I've seen uh, Dee and others in the uh, in Limerick Chamber uh, lobby for that, lobby for a continued wage subsidy scheme to keep going as people come back to work. Even if it's slightly modified, that people, especially if you think about it, there's people going to come back to work, but they're only going to have not all of their staff, or they're going to have to physical distance. If you think about, you know, creches, for example, they might only have been able to take half, their, half the children they normally would or a quarter. So for that, we still need those supports to be in place. The waiving of commercial rates for the three-month period, the annual returns and tax returns being deferred into June, tax liability has been deferred, the business continuity voucher, which, guys, if you take one thing away and if you haven't applied for the business continuity voucher from your Leo and you, do, you, have, you fit the criteria for it, please get onto it. The closing time at the moment, as, as it was this morning, is still 5.30 this afternoon, unless anybody has a, a further rep update. I was talking to somebody yesterday and they felt that it was going to be extended, but I have nothing on that at the moment. So hopefully you'll get that uh, business continuity voucher, two and a half thousand euro, trading online voucher, and two and a half thousand euro with a 10% backing from the company. And then you have working capital loans and additional supports available at Enterprise Ireland and Leo's and Udras de Gueltokta. So quick one on the trading online voucher for yourselves there. Um, you can read that in your own time. I know we're coming close to the end. The most important one there is the business continuity. Two and a half thousand euro voucher, which is payable to a third party contractor to help you with your COVID requirements. Again, critical thing, it expires today. Very short application process. Get it into the Leo uh, if that's something you can avail of and you might be able to benefit from that and hopefully you can if you haven't done already. Um, the capital loan scheme then, 25K to 1.5 or uh, 1.5 million loan at 4%. Just a couple of links to some key documents for you. The NSAI document, the return to work protocol document, the reopening business document, and HSA gui HSE guidelines. So they're all available to you, and we will forward those to you on the soft copy of this presentation. And as I said, it's content heavy, but it's useful maybe as a reference for you afterwards. And then the last slide basically just basically said, this is what we have in a lot of the end of our courses. It's great to have plans, but obviously we actually have to put them into place now. We have to take the various considerations we have and we have to look at them each individually and we have to build up our, our COVID response plan around each of those. We have to do our risk assessments, our safety statement, we have to do our COVID response plan, our return to work questionnaires. All of these things are physical distancing, looking at our facilities, looking at our business continuity, looking at our HR and how we engage and communicate with our staff. All of these are different things that we need to do. So no, it's not just a health and safety uh, requirement in terms of COVID response you know, it's the full complement of, of things that we need to look at to try and manage and make our business safe for the return of ourselves, our staff, and our customers. 
So hopefully uh, you will have taken some benefit out of that, that session there. And I believe there might be some questions uh, popping in there, but maybe Creva or, or Dee will pop back in there for me. So as I said, thanks very much for, for engaging with the session so far. Much appreciated. And if uh, Optima Training can do anything for you, we'd be delighted to assist you in any way. Just reach out to us. Our contact details are there on the presentation. Hey Adrian, it's Quiva. So I've just sent you on a few of the questions there that's coming in in the chat section and in the Q&A section we have a few questions as well. Okay. So, so just going to just going to have a look there on the chat just to see some questions coming in. Uh, initiatives to certify that a business is C19 friendly. Not at the moment. There is business continuity in terms of ISO. Uh, there's auditing in terms of ISO, but nothing specifically around um, the, 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 the certification on that just at the moment. Okay, that was from Colm. Um, Paul, are the guidelines in place uh, post? So are there these guidelines in place post vaccine? The vaccine will be the most important factor, but I believe it's going to be a while yet before it's rolled out. So I think physical distancing and some of the tactics here are here to stay, to be honest. Um, I don't see them really going out. I think we're, we're living now in a new reality and uh, certain things aren't going to go just because we come back to work or just because there's a vaccine rolled out. There is also a fear, I suppose, that you know there's a second phase of a virus often happens. And you know, I know the medical professionals are very, very concerned that we, we look at this winter, this October, November, December, and being very, very careful that even when we come back, that there's no kind of complacency that sets in. Otherwise, we're going to be back to the start again, and we're going to face another six months out of business and all the rest of that that happens. Um, so just looking at a couple of other questions. Okay, post-vaccine, I have a couple of those. Temperature requirements seems to have got a lot of media coverage. Okay, of no value, wasting resource. So uh, there, that's, that's something that has been described as that. And uh, thanks, Derek, for the, for the question. Um, definite advice. Okay, the advice is you retain the right as an employer to do it. I'm very clearly aware that some, some employers are not doing it and have decided that they're, they're not going to do it. If they don't do that, they have a legal requirement within the within or a duty of care within the uh, protocols to make sure they put something in place there so they can risk assess as to whether somebody might have the virus. How do you do that if you don't temperature scan? Temperature scanning, just because somebody is above 38.0 degrees does not mean they have the virus or even might have the virus. Uh, might be a cold, chest infection, you know, anything like that might cause a, a, a spike in temperature. But it is just an area, a way of detecting I know a lot of businesses are asking people to type temperature scan at home and note that through an app. So they're actually not doing it on the business at all because again, it's what they consider wasting resources, wasting time and a GDPR concern. So that's definitely something that are doing Derek, absolutely. Uh, just go down to uh, bear with me. So a couple of other questions. Just see if there's anything else. Another question from Derek. Um, okay, so that was the temperature control one. Yeah, the option. Absolutely. Do staff have the option? That de that depends on the company. So you, the company role has its own employment handbook. Do they have a work from home policy? Are they going to facilitate that? The one thing I think is definite is that where before we were all maybe saying, and I, I, I include myself in this, staff would have said like they'd like to work from home and we would kind of said, you know, it's very difficult. It's very hard to manage people. We now have a new reality where we're asked, after asking staff to work from home for the last number of months to keep our business alive. And they have done that. Very difficult for us to turn around going forward and stop staff from working from home. So I do think, yes, we're going to have to have our work from home policy and try and be as flexible as possible. It has to work for the business, though. That's the critical thing. You know, if you're a manufacturing facility, you can't do assembly at home, more than likely. So those people, some people have to come to the office. For office-based staff and administrators, can they work from home? Absolutely. Uh, and, and should they be allowed? I think they should. But uh, that's up to each company to decide that. Um, Catherine, thanks for the question. Our company never closed, have a number of staff working. What should we do about the return to work questionnaire? Catherine, all I suggest you do is we issue, you issue a return to work questionnaire now. If they haven't been out of work, then you still have to issue the questionnaire just to make sure you have that and you have that documented. I would, I would prefer that. And also make sure you have your staff reinduction completed and you have that documented. It's all very well having these, but we do need a way of documenting them. Uh, Paul, is there facility management guidelines specifically for retail outlets? Yes, so I know I've come across some information specifically for retailers um, and I know there's uh, some providers out there who are looking at that area on their own. I can follow back up with you, Paul, if you want to drop me an email on that. I have seen a document that was prepared specifically for the retail sector and we are doing training actually for, specifically for the retail sector as well. Um, so that's, that's something else. Uh, final question, what level of training is required by the team in charge? So compliance manager training really, um, 
this is a one hour session, really a 45 minute session. We've also got sessions that last for two hours and that goes into more depth in each of the areas such as health and safety, such as infection control and what actually from a practical point of view needs to be done. But there's a COVID-19 a COVID compliance manager course that's kind of a three hour half day course and that's sufficient. We run that also um, and that would be sufficient for people who would lead that and that would very much go into the leadership and communication aspect of what that person and their roles and responsibilities need to do. I keep seeing the last question, but I'll keep going for the moment. Contact logging, close contacts. Yeah, so basically for the two meters a requirement and it is a requirement for of employees to complete that. So the onus is on the employer to make sure we roll out that policy and then we have each employee uh, complete that. So that what that is for basically is if something is detected afterwards, they will go back in. So if there's a positive case, for example, they will go back in and check so that for the 40, 48 hour period before that person became symptomatic, they will check back on the contacts log and then they may ask people based on a risk assessment whether that person needs to self-isolate or anything else. And um, so there's a couple of things. Uh, if anybody else has anything else, my own email address there is a.carmody at, excuse me, at optimatraining.ie or reach out to me on LinkedIn or any other way. Um, and you can ask further questions there at the moment. So. Hopefully, as I said, you'll have found this situation, the, the, the session to be of value. There's, I think there's a lot to it. Sometimes there's a lot more than what people originally thought. I think that's the kind of general reaction that I get a little bit. There's, 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 it's not just health and safety. There's an awful lot more to it. But we can assist if you want any assistance. Uh, give, us a sh give me a shout. Contact logging, just uh, from Ray there. Is there a template available for contact logging? There is. I can share that and I can pop that out as a follow-up to all of this. So again, thanks very much. Um, we better draw to a close. We've gone way over time. Thank you very much for everybody for engaging with us. Um, thank you very much again for Quiva, D, and all that uh, Limerick Chamber and Anne at Limerick Chamber for having us deliver this session for you. Um, we'd be delighted you know, to help anyone out that needs any assistance, so uh, just contact us and we will get out this communication out to you as a follow-up with the presentation with all the details there that are on that um, and all the links to, the, to both the supports and also the documentation. Final point, remember the business continuity, two and a half thousand euro. It would be a pity to leave that go if you haven't applied for it and you qualify for it. Thanks very much, guys. And uh, we're just going to wrap up now. Thank you. Mm -hmm.